Hi, I'm Stephen with AlbertaUrbanGarden.ca. When I first started looking at low-cost organic gardening, I went looking for a replacement to my traditional organic fertilizer. At the time, I simply wanted to replace the practice, and I didn't question the practice of using a fertilizer at all. Upon a little bit of research, what really jumped out quickly to me was compost tea. This was something that I could do at home with some compost and water and some relatively inexpensive equipment. On this month's installment of the Testing Garden Assumptions series, I'm going to take a look at two of the main claims made about compost tea. For the purpose of today's episode, it is important to note that there is more than one definition of compost tea. I will be using the definitions found within this book, Teeming with Microbes. They define two different types of compost tea, actively aerated compost tea and compost extractions. Actively aerated compost tea, which I'll refer to as AACT, is a method that recommends the use of compost and a sugar source such as molasses or kelp with supplemental air provided by an air stone or bubbler to create a tea that has a high concentration of bacteria and then you use it in the garden. Compost extractions are a different method where it is recommended to add compost to water and let it sit for a week or two, allowing the nutrients in the compost to leach out to the water. Eventually, the water should become an organic fertilizer. Understanding why fertilizer is used in the garden is a little more intuitive. By providing water-soluble nutrients to the plants in their root zone, they can usually take it up right away. Bacteria, however, may require a little more explanation to see why they are important in the garden. As I've spoken about in the past, bacteria, along with other organisms, form the nutrient cycle in the soil. Bacteria break down complex molecules and release nutrients that are plant available where they can access them. In other cases, beneficial bacteria can fix atmospheric nitrogen, again releasing it into the soil in a form the plant can use. A compost extraction and AACT are said to add nutrients and bacteria to your soil when used in the garden. So if plants need both nutrients in the form of a fertilizer and bacteria, using compost tea in the garden must be a good practice, right? Well, I've put together a little experiment to put these two main claims to the test. Before we move on, I'd like to clarify something. I am not addressing store-bought compost tea products. I will touch on those in a later episode. The first hypothesis is that through the brewing process, AACT in the water increase the number of bacteria. And the second hypothesis is that compost extractions extract nutrients from the compost, increasing the nutrient content of that water, making it an organic fertilizer. In order to test today's hypothesis, I sent a number of samples to Maxim Analytics for analysis, including the component materials, rainwater, molasses, and the compost that I used for the tea. I used homemade compost that was made using a hot bacterial driven compost method, followed by a slower fungal dominated one. This should ensure that the compost is well broken down and should have rich concentrations of both bacteria and fungi. The water was collected from my rain barrel and was all from the same batch. No new rain was added during the course of this trial. This was the same rain barrel that I ran analysis on to see if the rainwater was safe to use in the garden. In order to cultivate the bacteria found within the compost, most advocates recommend a sugar source. The most common sugar sources that I found are an unsulfured molasses or kelp. I use molasses as I have extreme reservations on the use of kelp in the garden. I produced three different batches of compost tea using different methods. I kept them here in my garage at room temperature. The basic recipe that I followed to make actively aerated compost tea was based on an amalgamation of the methods presented by advocates. I chose to focus on an AACT that could easily be made at home. To make AACT, you need a bucket, an air stone, compost, water, and a sugar source. I used a five gallon pail from a big box store and ensured that it was relatively clean. The air source, I used a high output micro bubbler air stone. The pump I used was sized for a 30 gallon tank. I added two cups of compost, one tablespoon of unsulfured molasses, and four gallons of rainwater. Once mixed in the pail, I added the air stone and ran it for 48 hours as recommended by leading advocates. The addition of the sugar and oxygen should allow the bacteria concentrations to increase within the water. The second batch that I made was a simple extraction. I placed the same volume of compost as the AACT batch in the same volume of rainwater and left it for seven days with a firm lid sealing the container. This method should allow us to maximize the amount of nutrients that will transfer from the compost 
to the water. The third batch that I made was the same as the AACT batch number one. However, I did not let it brew for 48 hours. Rather, I sampled it right away. What this should allow us to do is to understand if the AACT brewing process increases the number of bacteria found within the water and if any more nutrients are transferred to the water during that brewing period. It is now time to test the nutrient content of the compost teas to see if they have any value as organic fertilizer. I am only going to touch on the elements that are proven or suspected to be beneficial or essential for plant growth. I used a real percent difference statistical tool to determine if there is any difference between the control and the AACT. The results did show that there was a statistical increase in the concentration of 7 of the 15 commonly tested for nutrients in the AACT when compared to the control. I then compared the nutrient concentrations of the compost extraction to the AACT. If the compost extraction really does allow for more nutrients to leach into the water, it should have a higher concentration than the AACT that has only spent 48 hours in the water as opposed to 7 days. The same RPD analysis showed no statistically significant differences in the nutrient concentrations between both methods. This result isn't really all that surprising as I used the same amount of compost in each of the batches. If you say added more compost to the water, you may see an increase in the amount of nutrients that are transferred to the water. However, at some point, that water is going to hit a balancing point or equilibrium with the compost, meaning it doesn't really matter how much compost you add. There's only so much nutrients that will be able to transfer from the compost to the water. Once it hits equilibrium, it's not going to increase anymore. There are some nutrients within the AACT and the compost extraction. However, without a benchmark, it's really hard to know if these concentrations are enough to be useful. So, I had a 2020-20 synthetic fertilizer that was already diluted to the recommended rate run as well. I used a synthetic fertilizer as a baseline because the companies that are making it are not going to add anything in too high or too low of concentrations. The companies that produce synthetic fertilizers do a whole lot of trial batches in order to figure out the concentration of nutrients within their products so that when consumers take it home and use it, they get consistent results every time. As such, I feel it's more than valid to use a synthetic fertilizer, especially something like a 20-20-20, as a baseline to get a, a general understanding whether or not our compost teas have enough nutrients within them to be considered useful in the garden. When comparing the synthetic fertilizer to both the actively aerated compost tea and the compost extraction, all three had equal concentrations of three elements. But for the most part, the synthetic fertilizer had significantly more. These results indicate there is limited value in the fertilizer potential of actively aerated compost tea and compost extractions made under these common methods. Let's move on to the claim that the process of actively aerating compost tea increases the concentration of bacteria found within the water. This is very simple to test. We simply used a plate count and if actively aerated compost tea actually increases bacterial numbers, we should see higher numbers in the batch that brewed for 48 hours as opposed to the one that did not. There are limitations to the plate count method. The first is not all of the bacteria can be cultured. However, those that can represent a wide variety and should be representative enough to see a comparative increase. The second is that the method does not actually tell us which bacteria are present, just the total number of culturable bacteria. These results were quite surprising. In all cases, the samples had more than 12,000 coliform forming units per milliliter. Maxima Analytics even tried to raise the detection limit to see if they could differentiate between the samples, and even that failed to do so. These results neither support nor refute the hypothesis that actively aerating compost tea increases the concentration of bacteria found within the water. In fact, these results speak to the core of why we would be brewing compost tea at all. If the rainwater that we use in the garden already has such high concentrations of bacteria within it, and so does the compost, why would we go to the effort of culturing bacteria through actively aerating compost tea at all? Today I set out to see if compost tea could act as an organic fertilizer through a compost extraction, and if we could culture more bacteria in an actively aerated compost tea. The results do not seem to support the statement that a compost extraction is a good and worthwhile fertilizer. And we even questioned whether or not we need to culture bacteria as the rainwater and compost that we use in our gardens already have so many.
Normally at this time of the video, if the evidence is not supporting the hypothesis that we've put forward, I like to provide an alternative method that allows you to gain the same benefits within the garden. As I feel I've only addressed about half of my questions about compost tea, I'm going to delay this recommendation. There are just too many claims made about compost tea products, application techniques, and associated benefits in the garden that I would like to do a follow-up video. If you have any compost tea related claims that you would like me to address in that video, please put it in the comment section below so that I can make sure to address them in my follow up video. In two weeks, I'm going to address the remainder of the claims and make a determination if I will still recommend the use of compost tea or abandon it. If I abandon the practice, I will also propose a replacement strategy.